Good morning. God is good. Praise his name. All right. Well, thankful for these few clouds that God has given us this morning. You know, as I was uh, I was out praying this morning and you know, sometimes when I uh, come before the Lord uh, on a Sunday, you know, there's different things that I, I feel since. But uh, one of the things I uh, experienced this morning was just an overwhelming sense of love for, for you um, and just God's care for his people. And, you know, we live in a, a world full of trouble and trial, tribulation, but uh, God God has a word of hope and encouragement and strength for you today because he loves you. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. And we live in a world that is deceived and tells us that God is not really for us, that God's not really good, but the word of God speaks louder (laughs) than those messages. It speaks a message of love that God is for us. And it's not just a a feeling, it's demonstrated tangibly in the gift of Jesus Christ and Jesus coming into the world. And he came into the world for for us, for his people, to redeem and purchase a people, to be his very own, to be co-labors, to be representatives of God. In fact, the Bible says that in Christ that we are destined to not only rule this earth, but to rule all of creation. That was the design that God created us in his image to be co-rulers, co-laborers in his created order. And so the devil wants to rob us of that destiny, but God's word is stronger. And he came to redeem a people, to be his very own, to be his very special possession, to bring light into the darkness. That's why Jesus came. This morning, uh, we're going to be in Genesis chapter 37. We're walking this summer through uh, the stories in Genesis of the great men and women of faith. that We call them the patriarchs. But the, the series is really focusing on faith. And what is faith? And what does faith in God mean for us? You know, the way the New Testament talks about faith, it always refers back to these stories in Genesis and these people in Genesis who walked with God. Now, as we've been going through this series, we're discovering these people were far from perfect, (laughs) right? Uh, Actually pretty dysfunctional, pretty flawed in many ways. But what we discover is, is God is not looking for perfect people. He's looking for people who will put their faith, their trust in him. You see, faith has less to do with uh, our capability, what we're able to do in our own strength, but much more in who God is. And so the object of our faith is what matters. Who are we trusting? Who are we looking to? Who are we believing in? And that's, that's the call. The Christian call is to put our faith in God. You know, um, as we begin the, the Joseph story, we're going to see a little bit of a change. We've been introduced to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and some of the great women of faith like Sarah and Rebecca, even Hagar, and we looked at Tamar last week. Um, People that God had called by his word to be his followers. And uh, what we see over and over, even though they're flawed and perfect, they keep coming back to the Lord. They keep coming to the place of worship, coming to the place of faith, coming to the place of trust. And now we're going to see Joseph a little bit of a shift because in each of the stories it's highlighted the struggle, the wrestling like Jacob. But in Joseph we're going to begin to see the ideal, the picture that God has I think for all of us to live this life of faith in complete obedience and complete trust. And in Joseph we begin to see um, the hint and the picture of what God promises in Genesis 3 that God would send a son who would crush the head of Satan. So we begin to see this theme of the Messiah, the Savior, because as people, we're incapable of overcoming our struggles on our own, and we see the grace of God 
whether it's a lamb provided to Abraham on that altar instead of Isaac, or it's Jacob wrestling with the angel instead of him being destroyed. He walks away with a limp, but coming into full realization of his need for God. And so we see this theme of grace. And then we begin to see in the person of Joseph, God's full plan of sending a redeemer, a savior, a deliverer, whose righteousness can cover all of our shame, all of our sin. But just as Christians, we see Jesus as our Messiah, as our Lord, our Savior. The Christian calls to be disciples, to become like Christ. And so it's not just that God saves us through the work of Christ, but he begins to save us through the sanctification, the transformation of our very being. We become different kinds of people. We become new creations. We begin to walk in the holiness and the righteousness of God that God intended for us. And so in Joseph, we begin to see the picture of the ideal of what it means to live by faith. Now, um, as a pastor, I'm always thinking of illustrations, and sometimes they drop into my life, and I don't really want them <laughs> in my life because they're not always good things. But um, how many of you have dreams? And by dreams, I don't mean just what you think uh, or dream of at night as you're sleeping. I think that's one kind of dreaming, and I think God uses those kind of dreams. But I think every one of us has different dreams, things that God has put in our hearts, things that God has spoken to us, things that we long for, that we desire, that we see for our lives. And especially when you're young, there's so many things stirring in you. As many of us older people, we look back to those dreams we had when we were younger. Maybe you're here this morning, and those dreams are still really real in your life, whether it's a career or it's a way of living in the world or accomplishing different things. Those dreams, I believe, come from God. God has, it says, put eternity in our hearts. We weren't made just uh, to be a clump of cells, meaningless in this life. We have a purpose. There's meaning to life. And so when God puts those stirrings, those dreams in us, that's a gift of grace. It's God's design of what he's put in us as image bearers of God. Well, one of the, this is a little dream, but one of the dreams I've had is to run up mountains. And, uh, and so uh, last few weeks, I, um, I had an attempt, and I failed in my attempt. But I still have this dream. And this week, I, I took the hardest fall I've taken on a run. And, and as I was thinking about Joseph, and I realized God was teaching me something about dreams as well. And so we have these goals. We have these aspirations. We have these things that we're longing for. But then we run up against the obstacles, <laughs> the challenges the frailty, the incapability sometimes that we have, and circumstances that come into our lives. So I want you to think about that and the dreams that God's put in you, the things that you're longing for. And it could be small things like running up the mountains, or it could be bigger things about your purpose in life and the calling that God's put on your life. But think about that as we begin the story of Joseph. Now, we're introduced to Joseph in Genesis 37. If you, in, if you have your Bibles, you can turn there. And uh, I'm not going to read the whole chapter, but I'm going to read portions of this chapter. And we're introduced in chapter 37, uh, verse 2, that Joseph was a young man of 17 years old. So if some of you are right in that period of life. You're maybe 17. Some of you remember 17. That's a time for dreaming. That's a time for imagining and dreaming about what, what purpose, what does God have for me in this place. Well, we know that Joseph is born into a very dysfunctional family. <laughs> How many of you were born into a dysfunctional family? <laughs> all of us, right? At some level, all of us have, uh, have struggles and families that, but we're introduced in Genesis 37 that Joseph at 17, he's caring for sheep with his brothers. He's helping his brothers. He has a low position there. His father has two wives plus these two other women, and so there's all this competition and jealousy in the family. And then we're told in verse 3 that Israel, this is Jacob's new name, his new identity, loved Joseph more than any of their sons. Is that a problem? <laughs> oh boy. So Joseph had a father who loved him, but he had brothers who hated him. And, uh, and then in verse 5, we're told that Joseph had a dream, and he told it to his brothers, and they hated him all the more. 
And this is his dream. Listen to this. Verse 7, we were binding sheaves of corn out of the field when suddenly my sheaf rose and stood upright while your sheaves gathered around mine and bowed down to it. His brother said to him, do you intend to reign over us? Will you actually rule us? And they hated him all the more. By the way, it repeats that over and over. They hated him. They hated him, right? Um, will you actually rule over us? And then verse 9, and then, they had an, then he had another dream, and he told it to his brothers. Listen, he said, I had another dream, and this time the sun and the moon and the eleven stars were bowing down to me. And when he told his father as well as his brothers, his father rebuked him and said, What is this dream that you had? Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow down to the ground before you? His brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the matter in mind. And so I think we can all relate on some level to this. And by the way, I think these, these stories are history. That These are unique things that happened in history with God choosing Joseph. But, but there's lessons here for all of us in our own unique lives. And one of the things I see in this story is uh, dreams are powerful things. D those things that God puts in us are powerful things, but they're risky, right? And especially if you tell someone. And maybe we could look at Joseph and say, maybe he should have kept quiet. <laughs> but when something's birthing in you, you have to tell someone. And, uh, and this was a chaotic, bad situation with his brothers. And, but he's telling these dreams, but immediately people want to shoot it down, right? And have you ever experienced that? Have you ever experienced where someone wants to shoot down your dream? I remember um, when I was in high school, I had a teacher who uh, wasn't very impressed with my academic skills, and uh, she would often say, Ben, you're not going to amount to anything. And she would say, Ben, you'll never go to college. You'll never be able to do this. You'll never be able to do that. And we've had those messages in our lives. We've had people who've spoken those things to us. When, when God is stirring things in us and we, we know he's given us gifts, and he's given us desires, he's given us uh, things that he's called us to, but, but there's always going to be people who speak against those things and seek to destroy those things. I remember as a young college student, God had uh, clearly was calling me into ministry, and, and in particular ministry to the local church. And, and my heart was just was bursting, and I had I'd given up certain things in my life so I could dedicate more time to being involved in the local church, to serving and sharing the gospel with others. And, and, um, and one of the, the jobs I had to do uh, in college as I prepared uh, for ministry, I had to pay my way through college, and so one of the jobs I got was on college campus washing windows, but also picking up trash. So I'd get up like at five in the morning, and I'd begin to pick up trash in downtown Chicago, and there was trash everywhere, so it was, usually took me about an hour to do that time, and, and that was a rich time of communing with God, but um, almost every week, sometimes multiple times, uh, there was a professor of that college and uh, over the course of four years, he never asked my name. He never wanted to get to know me. But every time I saw him, he would always say the same thing to me. He would say, every time I see you, I remember the Greek god Sis Sisyphus. I think it's Sisyphus. And this was the Greek god that would, uh, was condemned to rolling a stone up the hill. And as his punishment, he would have to roll the stone up the hill, but it would never reach the top. <laughs> so he would do it over and over again and never get to the top. And, um, and this professor, he would always say, you remind me of Sisyphus. And uh, that wasn't very encouraging <laughs> to me. Am I destined to a life of picking up trash, right? And, uh, and then there's this gap, right, in our lives sometimes between where we're at, what we're doing, and then the things that God is stirring in us and calling to us. And I look at the Joseph story and we're, in verse 12, we're, we're told that the brothers were taking Jacob's flocks, and they were in Shechem, and then they go to another place, and, and uh, Jacob, uh, Jacob sends Joseph out to check on his brothers, which, by the way, is a dangerous job because um, last time he had brought a bad report <laughs> to his father, so his brothers really hate him. And, uh, and so his father sends him out again to kind of check on them. And by the way, he's been given this incredible... Uh, coat, right? This ornate coat because his father loves him, which I think is a, is a picture of God's love for each of us, for each of you. Did you know 
in the rest of the Bible, robes are a picture of righteousness. It's the gift of God's righteousness given to us. In Revelation, as the people of God are standing before the throne, they are wearing white robes. In fact, this, pic this picture of Joseph's robe sometimes is translated as many colors, sometimes it's ornate. It doesn't, we don't really know. All we know, it's a, it's a special robe that signifies the Father's love. And that's the robe that God wants to put on each one of us. He wants to cover our shame, cover our guilt, and he wants to give us his righteousness. And so Joseph goes out in his ornate robe to his brothers who hate him. And then in verse 17, he finds out that they moved to a place called Dothan. And I'm going to begin reading. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them near Dothan. But they saw him from the distance. And before he reached them, they plotted to kill him. Here comes that dreamer, they said to each other. Come now, let's kill him and throw him into one of these cisterns and say that a ferocious animal devoured him. And then we'll see what comes of his dreams. And when Reuben heard this, he tried to rescue him from their hands. Do not take his life, he said. Don't shed any blood. Throw him into the cistern here in the wilderness. But don't lay a hand on him, Reuben said to this, to rescue him from them and take them back take him back to his father. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the ornate robe he was wearing, and they took him and threw him into the cistern. The cistern was empty and there was no water in it. And they sat down to eat their meal and they looked up and they saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead. And their camels were loaded with spices, balm, and myrrh, and they were on their way to take them down to Egypt. And Judah said to his brothers, What will we gain if we kill our brother and cover up his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites, and not lay our hands on him after all. He is our brother, and our own flesh and blood, and his brothers agreed. So when the Midianite merchants came by, his brothers pulled Joseph out of the cistern, and sold him for 20 shekels of silver to the Ishmaelites who took him to Egypt. When Reuben returned to the cistern and saw that Joseph was not there, he tore his clothes. He went back to his brothers and said, the boy isn't there. Where can I turn now? Then they got Joseph's robe, slaughtered a goat, and dipped the robe in blood. And they took the ornate robe back to their father and said, we found this, examine it to see whether it's your son's robe. He recognized and said, it is my son's robe, and some ferocious animal has devoured him. Joseph has surely been torn to pieces. Then Jacob tore his clothes, put his sackcloth, and mourned for his son many days. All his sons and daughters came to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. No, he said, I will continue to mourn until my son in the grave, until I join my son in the grave, so his father wept for him. Meanwhile, the many nights sold Joseph in Egypt to Potiphar, one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard. So this is quite a turn in the story. So we're told Joseph has a dream given by God, put in him. And that dream comes into conflict with the reality of his circumstances. Have you ever experienced that? The gap between the promise of God and then the reality of where you find yourself? I think, I think we've all been there in different ways, different places. Maybe not to the extreme of Joseph, but some of us have experienced extreme things. And usually it's at the hands of other people. So last week, as we looked at Judah and Tamar, and I'm so glad we didn't skip over that story because it is a story that points us to the reality of what God wants to do. He wants to cover our shame. And so in the Judah and Tamar story, we saw the shame and the guilt of our own rebellion against God, our own shameful actions, Judah's abuse and use of Tamar, and how Tamar took matters into her own hands. And so we, we saw the dysfunction of that personal choices. But in the Joseph story, sometimes it's not the things we do, but it's the things that are done to us. And sometimes by people who should have loved us, should have been for us, but instead turn against us and use us and abuse us because of envy, hatred, jealousy. It's the Cain and Abel story, right? <laughs> Cain and Abel before God, and, and, and Cain in his anger and his jealousy murdered his brother. In some ways, this is like a murder. And so we begin to see the human condition. And if we think about the most painful things that have happened in our lives, usually it's at the hands of other people. 
people who've said things against us, done things to us. And so all of us can identify with the story in one way or the other. We've all been hurt in one way or the other. So what do we, what do, we do with that? And I'm so thankful that God has revealed to us a way through that. That God is not just on his throne so far from us. Rather, he comes near. And then in Joseph, we begin to see the heart of God of how he wants to redeem that gap between the promise, <laughs> right, and the reality of where we find ourselves. And so some of you may not be at the bottom of a well today, but it feels like you're at the bottom of a well. Maybe you're in a really dark place, and it doesn't feel like there's a way out. Here's the hope and the encouragement. God sees you in that place. God saw Joseph in that place. And he spared Joseph's life, and he made a way through that circumstance. And what we begin to see in the life of faith in God is that we begin to see that God, and there's a song about this, how God makes a way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, right? And so God is the one who can make a path through the discouragement, through the disappointment, through those dark valleys in our lives. I can't help but think of Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, right? He makes me lie down besides quiet, on green pastures, by quiet waters, refreshes my soul. And even though I walk through the valley of shadow of death, he is with me. You begin to see the heart of God, the plan of God, and that gap between the promise and the dream and the reality of Mary we find ourselves. And one of the great struggles we have as human beings is, as we've been hurt, as Joseph comes on the other end of his brother's hatred, <laughs> what do we do with that? What do we do with that hurt? And we live in a world full of resentment, full of anger, <laughs> full of all the, the junk of things that have happened in families, in nations, in communities, in the world. Our world, our story is filled with wars, whether it's wars in homes, wars in neighborhoods, wars between nations. This gets to the very heart of the human condition, this gap between our longing, <laughs> our dream, the reality and the promise of God for a world and for a design that we sense deep in our souls. We know that we were created for more. <laughs> we know that the secular message that we're just an accident, just a clump of cells and floating in this meaningless universe, we know that's not true because deep down we know there's meaning, there's significance, there's purpose. And we know deep down that our suffering is not wasted. It's not meaningless. I'm going to invite the worship team to come up here this morning. We're just starting the Joseph story. And many of you know how this story ends, right? But I want to pause there in the Joseph story because I want us to really sense and see the heart of God for when we're in that place where it feels like we're deeply abandoned and we've been left all by ourselves and we're in a strange land, <laughs> we're in a strange place and we don't know what to do. How do we have faith in God in that moment, in that gap? Well, the good news is that Joseph is a, is a picture of Jesus Christ and how he comes into our lives. I love how Ephesians chapter 2 says that we have been saved by grace through faith. That our salvation is something that comes from God. We cannot boast. It's not by work so that no one can boast. But if you read that verse and it goes on, it says, For you are God's workmanship. You are God's handiwork. God has created you. He's made you. Your story has meaning. It has a purpose. It has significance in this world. And God sees you and he knows you. And God has prepared a glorious work for each of us. And so as we're in that, maybe that gap between the promise and then our reality, I can't help but look at Romans chapter 8. And I want you to look at this with me. It's one of the greatest chapters of the Bible. 
such an glorious promise that Jesus came near and he died for us and he rose again and he put his spirit in us. And in verse um, 15, it says, as we're in the midst of suffering, it says we can cry out, Abba, Father. And the spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. And so even if we hear the voices of others telling us that we are nothing, that we will never make it, we will never succeed, we won't survive, we won't make it. And even if we have people against us, we hear the voice of God that says, no, you are my son. And we can cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. That, and then it goes on to say that we are co-heirs with Christ. Indeed, if we share in his suffering, in order that we may also share in his glory. And here's the great promise, brothers and sisters. We live in a culture right now where a lot of churches are saying, hey, if you put your faith in God, Everything's going to go good. You're going to prosper. You're going to be healthy. You're going to be wealthy. Everything's going to go good. <laughs> but does that align with what God says? If Joseph is our ideal, if Jesus is our example that he went to the cross, then, then we have to look at suffering differently. It's not, it's not something that we're meant to escape from, but it's something we're to go through and there's a purpose there's a glorious purpose for suffering and this is what verse 18 says i consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us hold on to that promise hold on to that promise that our sufferings were not worth comparing with the glory that would be revealed in us. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected in hope. In hope. So I want you to hear this, brothers and sisters. The Joseph story is about hope. The Jesus story is about hope. Your story is about hope. Because our stories are a small, small part of a much bigger story. And it's the story of God. And it's a story about hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay. You will be liberated. I will be deliberated, liberated. Everything around us will be liberated and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. Hold on to that. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time, but not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly, and we groan. Some of you are facing disease. Some of you are facing circumstances that are so heavy, so hard, so difficult. You're suffering. You're watching people you love suffer. But know that God himself groans with you, with us. We groan eagerly or inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved, but hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But we hope for what we do not have. We wait for it patiently. Brothers and sisters, we have a living hope. And so even if, like Joseph, we find ourselves in that gap between the dream and the promise and the reality of our circumstances, we are the people who have hope hope because <laughs> we know what the story is about we know what our lives are about it's for a greater glory it's god's salvation it's god's redemption it's god's deliverance it's god's glory that's been revealed in us and through us because it says we know that in all things god works for the good of those who love him do you believe that who has called according to his purpose his purpose God has a greater purpose. He has a purpose for you. Your life matters. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son that they might be brought to be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. Brothers and sisters, the good news is no matter where you're at in your story, God has a bigger story, and it's a story of, remember, we buried our shame and our guilt, but it's a resurrection story. God is making you 
into a new person. He's making me into a new person. He's making this world into a new reality where that eternity, that dream, that desire will be made real. It will be made whole. It will be made complete. And God will do this. Will you join me in praying? Lord, we come before you so aware, God, of our own frailty. But we also see, God, this morning, because you have spoken it, that, God, you are doing a new thing. You are creating us, and you're making us into a new kind of people who can go through suffering, who can go through betrayal, who can go through hatred, who can go through circumstances that seem overwhelming beyond our ability. And God, you're writing a story of redemption. God, bring hope to the hopeless in this place. God, you know the, the hearts of each person here. And I just intercede and I groan with your Holy Spirit that God, you would supply the strength, the hope, the reality that our destiny is so much more, more than we could ever ask or imagine, so much greater, because God, you are greater, and you are our deliverer, and you are our Savior. We give you praise, in Jesus' name, amen.